if any of you don't know, I'm Hurley, but a lot of the time I'll be introduced at church as um, Hudson's son. Yeah. And uh, so Hudson's my dad. And one of the things I love about him is his amazing obedience when he's following God. And so I remember one of the stories he's told me is um, when he was probably early 20s, he was having a fire down at the creek, just hanging out with some mates, and he saw this drunk guy fishing about 20 meters down from him. And he heard a voice in his head. He heard God telling him to go say to that man that Jesus loves you, right? And he, and he did it. And the uh, story goes that later that night, that man died, probably, probably not ending up going to heaven. And that really struck me as a kid, just knowing that how important it is to be obedient to God. And so today I'll be talking about how we prepare the table through our obedience. Yes. Prepare the table. Man, who thinks of these themes? It's such a great analogy every time. <laughs> Prepares God, prepare God's table for others to come to know Him, right? So this ties in with the last few verses of Psalms 23. And uh, since it's a short chapter, I'm just going to go through the whole thing. And just for a bit of context, as a, as a teenager, David was a shepherd, right? So he would care for the sheep. He would provide for the sheep. He would guide the sheep. He would protect the sheep. And when David's writing this, he puts himself in the place of the sheep, knowing that as it says, the Lord is his shepherd, therefore he lacks nothing. Knowing that no matter what happens, the Lord would provide for him and protect him and care for him and guide him. Uh, the next part's pretty simple. It's just that Jesus brings refreshment to the weary. And he makes, he said, it said, it goes, he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters, and he refreshes my soul. Yes. And then it goes to say, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. He will be there to guide the lost to the table. But we have to help prepare the table through our obedience so that we can help fulfill the plans God has for others, but also for ourselves, because we know that God works through others to, when we're helping others to also help ourselves. And then the next bit, probably the most famous bit, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For if he is for me, then who is against me? Amen? Amen. And this is what caught my eye whilst reading this, so listen up. Um, goes, <laughs> it actually ties in with the whole theme. It's, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness... And love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So once the table is prepared, and whoever we have welcomed has come to Jesus, it is then that they declare that they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and they will have an eternal life with Jesus. But how can we be obedient to Jesus, right? Simple and dumb answer is just to like do what God says, I guess. But if we actually want to fully obey Him, we must read his word every day and ask God to empower us with his Holy Spirit so that everything we do in our life is going to honor him and bring, bring glory to him. Yes. And God sums it up pretty well himself in Psalms 46. He says, Be still and know that I am Lord. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So how then... Having a relationship with God, having a healthy fear of God, having, an, having a good, strong connection with Him and knowing what He has done for us. How can then God say to us, go, and we don't go? Right. The only reason that I can think of is fear of man, like fear of what other people think. So I encourage you guys to be bold and have courage when God is telling you to do something. The Bible says that all good comes from God, so don't let the evil thoughts from the devil hold you back when God instructs you to do anything. I'm just going to wrap up in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for everyone in this room, Lord. I pray that as they go through their week, Lord, that you would, you would help them, you would instruct them, and Lord, that they would follow your instructions with full first-time obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs> Introduce Reinhardt. Yes, sir. Thanks, Elby. That was amazing. Hey, church, what an amazing night to be in the house of God. I'm so excited. And for those of you who do not know me, my name's Ryan Hurd, and I'm one of the YA leaders at church here. And tonight what I want to share about is how to encourage and prepare the table. 
And the scripture that really inspired me for that was Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And this is what it says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's so important to encourage each other and stir up each other in love and good works because when we do that, we have unity. And when we are one-minded and one spirit, we have power and anointing. And the reason why that is because Psalm says how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live in unity and harmony. It is like precious oil poured out on the head of Aaron. And we know that oil denotes Holy Spirit and power. So as we stir each other up, as we prepare the table and we sit in communion and have fellowship with each other and we talk faith into each other, we build the church, right? And not only that, it's also important because it affects the state of our heart and that leads to the way we live. Because Proverbs says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And then Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we know that life and death is in our tongue. So whatever we speak, so we can choose to speak faith into each other. We can choose to speak love into each other. We can choose to encourage each other for love and good works. But we can also speak doubt and unbelief. So whatever our heart is abundant of, that will come out of our mouth. Right? And watch this. This is really powerful. It says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So the question is, how do I guard my heart? How do I make sure that my heart is full of faith, full of love, full of self-control, full of the fruits of the Spirit? How do I make sure that my heart is in the condition that encourages others at all times? So the answer is really simple. It's just that when I surround people who are like-minded, when I surround people who are kingdom-minded, when I surround people who are full of faith, sitting in the table with me, encouraging me, what happens is my mind gets set on the things of God. My mind becomes kingdom-minded. I start talking about faith. I start talking about the things of God because the anointing rubs into one another. Yeah? And it's just about that because... Um, I just want to share a short story that I don't know if Jeremy knows that, but a couple of weeks back as I was writing my assignment and I just got like marks deducted for not italicizing a word. That's really stupid, but, <laughs> <laughs> but those who study law will understand this. But the thing about that is I was really upset and I couldn't pray and read the word. And I told myself that I'll probably just put on some worship music and drive to work. But then next thing I know, I get a text from Jeremy Cake at 7.30 in the morning. And this is what it says. Hey, Legend, I heard your message last Sunday. It was so good, and the kids are still talking about it. And you wouldn't believe how important that little message was for me to get me throughout. And I told myself, Ryan, you better pick yourself up and, <laughs> and start reading the word and start praying. Because that's what we're called to do, and that's what the scripture says that stir each other up in love and good works, encourage each other. So the thing is that whatever I meditate upon, whatever I set my mind upon, because Paul says, set your mind on the things above. Do not worry about earthly things. Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For doing so, all these things will be added unto you. Because when I do that, when I surround myself with people like Laura Armstrong, Rene Parker, Nick Warren, what happens is they talk faith into me. They talk word into me. They encourage me into love and fellowship and communion. And when I sit at the table with them, what happens is my mind starts to be set upon the kingdom of God, about the things of God. And what I put my mind to and what I meditate upon, that goes into my heart and affects my heart. And out of my, the abundance of the heart, then my mouth talks. And then what I talk and I walk is like everything that the Lord has done inside my heart. And it flows from within. And that walk affects my life. So this is really powerful. And I just want to conclude by saying, now that you know how important it is to gather and 
Please come to Bible studies. <laughs> All, right. All right. Next up, we have Renee Parker. Tell you what, she's such an amazing leader, and she's my favorite youth pastor. You cannot expect anyone better, because it's like she brings coffee after every service. Thank you, Rhina. <laughs> that, is, um, that is true, but that is only because my team has ordered it, and then I get the credit for it. So shout out to Jacob and to Emily and to Jeremy, who actually ordered those coffees for me to do that. But um, that's a tough gig to follow. Thanks, Pastor Andrew. Um, we've got some preachers in this house. But um, Hurley, I loved what you were talking about. Um, I also want to meet the person that comes up with these themes. It's probably God. Um, but, yeah, I loved what you t- spoke about, about preparing the table through obedience. And you, you reflect that in everything that you do as well, the way that you lead and the way that your friendships are. You've got God first and you've got a lot of influence on your life and we're so proud of you and raw youth. And Reinhardt as well. I didn't know that you can get points deducted for not using italics. That is stupid. You're right. That is crazy. I love that. How to encourage and prepare the table because encouragement does just change people's world. And out in the world, it is so um, not common to be encouraging. People expect that kind of cut down, don't they? Well, we have had such an awesome start to our night and I have the absolute privilege of finishing our night off and um, talking about prepare the table, our new theme. And it's all up, um, it's all up in the lead up to vision builders, which having a chat with one of my friends from high school who doesn't yet, yet come to church, but she just asked about what it is and, and why we put such an emphasis on vision builders. And I had to explain a little bit about what vision builders looked like and the fact that we put this gala dinner on, we dress up, we have some fun and we, we pledge an amount of money that we want to give to see our church flourish And so much like what Helen was saying tonight was the same vision that I have for Vision Builders and every time I pledge. And when I get married and when I have kids, we'll be pledging in this place as well because it's so much more not about how much money I'm giving, but it's actually about us individually as well. You know, I look at my vision builders and I go, if if I only give my kids this church then I've done my job. If I only pass on this inheritance to them, I've done my job. And much like what Helen was saying, it is. It's a multi-generational church where there is family all over. And Vision Builders is an exciting time of the year. And I love this theme because Prepare the Table is such an incredible picture about what we do as the church. You know, if you've ever held a dinner, you know that there's always going to be someone, one of your friends, who goes, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to tell you that I'm actually bringing my cousin's nephew's sister's son as well. And you're like, okay, cool. I've only got a set of like four cutlery that matches, and now you're going to throw off my whole aesthetic. But tonight, what I wanted to do was my title is called... um, (laughs) I know my title. My title is called Prepare the Table for Those Who Aren't Prepared. Now, with this table, right, you've gonna, you're going to, I picture a whole heap, multi-generational, uh, multicultural table filled with people who have a story, right? And that's what I picture Jesus did as well had a table filled with people with different stories, different backgrounds, different everything, coming together to share food. And in Luke 14, verse 12, he shares a parable to describe what it looks like to reach out to those and invite them to dinner. And it says, in verse 12, it says, did I say the thing? Luke 14, 12 to 14. (laughs) Awesome. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, 
He said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, or rich neighbors, for they will only invite you back. (laughs) That will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Isn't that an incredible picture? Like, I don't know about the brothers part. No, I'm joking. I'd invite my brothers. Um, but, you know, we, we often, when we put on a dinner party, we often just invite those people that were like, oh, they know me. I can wear my pajamas or, you know, they know what I'm going through at the moment or introverts are like, oh, they know I'm an introvert, so I don't have to talk too much. Extroverts are like, I know this person, so I can talk too much. Um, And it's almost like a moment where we take our eyes off ourselves and put them on to other people. And that's what the gospel is all about. It's all about stepping out of our comfortable place of our friendships and our families and our relationships where we feel super comfortable, super safe, and stepping into a place where we could actually share the goodness of God with someone over a meal. And Jesus did this so often throughout the Bible. But I just think if I hadn't had someone who invited me, I wouldn't have a place at the table. And I think we as as you know, members of this church, or maybe it's your first night here tonight, we were all invited by someone, right? Or maybe we just saw the sign and we drove straight in and we're here because someone put aside time to have a conversation with us about Jesus. Or maybe we've grown up in this church, but we're still here because we've got the greatest friends around us. We've got the greatest family near us. But I don't just want to stop there. When we invite people in, they get connected and we leave. I want to be a church that invites people in and invites people in and invites people in. But those people who can't repay what we've got to offer, that was me. Someone invited me and I could never repay what I've gotten out of church. I could probably work for the rest of my life, and I work here at church, so I'd probably just say, you know what, Pastor Andrew, don't pay me for the next 45 years, and we'll see if I can afford this building. It's more about the spiritual side, the friendships that I've made here, the family that I have here, the miracles that I've seen take place, the lives that aren't even mine that I've seen change. It's those kinds of things that I'll never be able to repay But I'm so glad that someone invited me to this banquet. I'm so glad that someone prepared the table for me to come and sit down. And my story, I was 18 and I was actually invited by Helen's parents. Um, So I grew up in church and then um, we left for about 10 years. And when I was 18, you kind of go through a big life change. Um, you girls, you might dye your hair, um, you might do some weird things, but I didn't, didn't really like who I was. I moved out of home. I didn't have the greatest relationships with my friends or my family, and I was just searching for so much more than what the world could give me, and I didn't even know. I just thought that what my life had to offer was it. And it wasn't until I call her Auntie Jocelyn and she would be like a spiritual mum, a spiritual grandma to so many in this room. And she started meeting with me every Wednesday, every Wednesday afternoon at 4.30 for San Churro. Who knows, that's how you save an 18-year-old. Amen. She knew what was going on. So much so, the, the manager, he always used to say, oh, you two, he's like, you two are so loud. You two stay for so long and you're eating San Churro at like dinner time. So we would be the only ones in there because we just talk for so long. And if you know Auntie Jocelyn, you know that we'd be able to have great chats. But she knew that 18-year-old Renee was never going to be able to give her 
anything in return that would equal what she was about to give me. And we caught up for weeks and weeks and weeks. And she never invited me to church. She always would just say, you know, Jesus loves you. And we'd just talk through life and she'd just guide me. But it wasn't until one Mother's Day that I said, you know what, I'm going to come along. And I can't tell you what was spoken about, but I just knew I was home. I just knew that I'd found my home. And it was just an overwhelming sense that I was here. And if I could grab the band as well, as we come into conclusion, that's, that's what we're here for. You know, it started with an 18-year-old girl that could never repay for what God did for her in this place. But it was that one person, my auntie Jocelyn, who stepped out and said, you know what? This might be a bit of a grind to get her to church. (laughs) It might be a few years until we see some fruit here. But she invited someone who couldn't repay her. She invited someone who might not have had their life together. She still doesn't have her life together. But that's what church is about. Church is about a big table filled with different kinds of people that have one thing in common, and that's that they love Jesus and that they're here for a a purpose far greater than what we ever thought we would have. And tonight, I just had this picture of my heart, on my heart, of a person that had a plate, right? And there's a big table and it's filled with people. And this person was trying to find a place to put their plate. And it was almost like, stop it. (laughs) It was almost like they felt like they couldn't, they couldn't sit in or there wasn't room for them at the table. The word that I had was like that there was like an unworthiness on their heart that they didn't feel like they could put a plate down and sit with us and eat. And it broke my heart because it was a moment that I said, well, God, why did you give me this picture? And it was actually a case that Jesus was just saying, come, I've got a place right next to me. I've got a seat right next to me, but because we're so overwhelmed and trying to find a place for ourselves or being, maybe you've tried to put down your plate and you've been hurt or maybe someone didn't see you or they didn't hear you. Jesus was right there saying, no, I've saved you a seat right here next to me. And in a moment that we could just stop and just look to Jesus, we would see him saying, I've got this seat right here for you. Stop. (laughs) I've practiced this so many times. (laughs) Pull it together. But I wanted you to just take this moment. I want you to think about, take yourself back to that point where someone invited you to church or you had that first conversation with them. Who was that person? And now think of, that person that you could be that person for. 